Thank you so much uh, for uh, your uh, uh, MCing and facilitation this evening. And I really want to uh, give a very big thank you and a warm welcome to all of you. I'm very excited uh, to be here with my brand new book, Winning with Relationships, just in case the Zoom background is not as clear as uh, it is to me. So personal development experts love to tout their formulas for success. And I should know because this is my sixth book and I do it in every one of them. But some formulas rise a little higher than others. And I would say the one that rises above them all is the one, relationships. Because truly without relationships, well, we can't succeed. And don't take my uh, opinion on this. Let's go to the research. So the Grant study is a study that started at Harvard University in the 1930s. And it's the longest longitudinal study of all time. And all the way back in the 30s, they wanted to figure out what were the critical keys for success. And they took a group of Harvard students and inner city youth from Boston. And they tracked them their entire lives. Now the study is still going on. Most of those people have now died and they're now following their children and their grandchildren. And they fully expected that the keys to success would be IQ, qualifications, how much work experience you have. Well, it turned out that wasn't true at all. So for instance, those with average IQ did as well as those with genius IQ, which is pretty good for me. So I took an IQ test and I, I tested negative. What about qualifications, degrees, diplomas? Well, if you think about it, the world is actually run by dropouts. Yeah? Bill Gates of Microsoft, Zuckerberg uh, of Facebook, uh, Richard Branson of Virgin, he's not a dropout. He never got to university to drop out. And right now, the dropouts on the call are saying, yes, I knew it. There's still hope for me. So qualifications, work experience, and IQ are helpful. They may get you through the door. But it turned out that neither of those were essential to achieving standout success. So what was? Well, it was one particular factor, folks. And people who registered highest on this factor earned, on average, $150,000 more than those who registered lowest. And on top of it, they were significantly happier. Now, you might think, particularly when it comes to professional success, that it would have been technical skills, that the best engineers would have rise to the top of the profession, that the best teachers would be at the top, that the best doctors would be at the top. Well, we might hope that that was the case, but in fact, it wasn't. The ones who earned $150,000 more than the ones who were lowest were those who are highest on, spoiler alert, one of the words is in the title of my book, relationships. It was the ones who had the strongest, warmest, most connected relationships. In fact, what was so astonishing uh, is that there was a 70% correlation between strong relationships and happiness. Now, you've got to know, in psychology, a 30% correlation is considered outstanding. This is 70%. That means that your relationships are the single most important external ingredients to your happiness. There is no such thing as success without successful relationships. The book I wrote before Winning with Relationships is this book here, Pitch to Win, and I really want to uh, do a warm uh, shout out here to my publisher, uh, Tim Richman, who's just done a phenomenal job with both these books. And the reason I wrote Pitch to Win is because I had done some work with a number of very high performing teams who'd achieved some great wins. And they asked me to create the formula so that they could then share it internally. And this is exactly what I did. But the more I began to work with these high performing winning teams, the more I realized that the pitch was actually won before the pitch. It was won in the extent to which they had built great relationships. I mean, think about it, folks. Who do you want to do business with? Well, people you know, trust, and like. Imagine somebody's got a great product, great service, but you really don't like them. Are you going to do business with them? No way, right? No way. The quality of our lives depends on the quality of our relationships. 
The Zulus say, Muntu nga muntu nga bantu. A person is only a person because of other people. Well, Western science has proven what African culture has known for millennia. This is the philosophy of Ubuntu. I am because we are. Now that might sound like quaint ancient wisdom, but it is even more profound than we realize. See, neuroscientists have actually proven what the Zulu people have been talking about all this time. There's a part of the brain called the mirror neuron network. We actually mirror the emotions and the behavior of the people around us. You just think about it, when somebody smiles, you tend to smile back, even if you're not entirely feeling like smiling, right? Because part of the brain actually that triggers smiling will be triggered in the presence of somebody who's smiling. In the Framington Heart Study, they found something extraordinary. If you have a close friend who becomes obese, you have a 56% increased chance of becoming obese yourself. Now, that's no excuse to blame your bigger friend when you slip up on your diet. But what it tells us is that we are way more interconnected. Why do so many of my clients, and I know many of you here are on the call tonight and welcome, why are, there's Mark Khan from London, from Investec London. Investec London, they are obsessed with culture. It's one of the most extraordinary cultures, Investec's culture, extraordinary culture. And they protect that culture like gold, why? According to a Harvard study, strong culture, strong corporate cultures have 700% increased income over 10 years than weak cultures. What is culture? Culture is not race, ethnicity, nationality. Culture is the way we do things around here. And it turns out the way that you and I do things tends to be the way the group that we find ourselves in tends to do things. Yeah. Now, Yes, that means we need to be careful about who we hang out with, right? Be with who you want to be. The Framington Heart Study found that uh, depression, happiness is equally contagious yeah, as eating habits. But it means that we actually have to be emotional leaders rather than emotional followers. Because yes, you will be tempted to fall into the negativity of the person around you, but you need to take charge right? So that you can exemplify. See, your greatest leadership tool is your own example. People don't listen to what you say. They listen to what you do. Their mirror neuron network, whether they like it or not, tends to connect with what it is that you are doing. Imagine a world where when you were happy, people were happy. When you were angry, they were angry. When you were conscientious and generous, they were conscientious and generous. Guess what? You live in that world. To a large degree, your behavior and emotions determines the behavior and emotions of people around you. If you choose to be a leader rather than a follower. So, there are a number of laws, 21, of course, these are not legal laws. You won't get arrested if you don't follow them, although your relationships may be arrested. So I'm not going to share all 21 because I want to uh, hand over to Jason shortly. But I thought, Jason, what I would do is just start with the first one because the first one is really primary. Yeah. And this really goes to the heart of great relationships, be they personal, or business. Yeah. You, you can measure how effective you are in your relationships, but the extent to which you are able to motivate others to do what you want done. How able are you to move people, to employ you, to be employed by you, to take a particular course of action, to be your friend, to marry you? Yeah. This is social influence. It's the extent to which you can move others, right? Now that might sound like manipulation, but we need to be very clear about the distinction. Manipulation is when you get somebody to do something that is in your interests, but not theirs. Now, you can do that a few times, but generally you'll be found out. And that's essentially the definition of a con man. Influence is when you get somebody to do something that is in your interest, yes, but it's in their interests too. So how do we do that? 
We do it with the foundation of the laws of influence, and that is law number one, give to get. If you want to get more, you need to give more. It's the beautiful law of the universe, this. Unfortunately, many people hear that as give as little as possible and then get, right? But the truth is, it's directly proportional, right? How much you get is based on how much you give. And so people often say to me, Justin, you know, what does it take to be successful? How do I be successful? And what I say to them is, don't try and be a person of success. Be a person of value and success will follow. When you bring value into the world, you will get value back. So Adam Grant is a professor, wonderful professor at Wharton Business School, and he's found that you can pretty much divide people into three, givers, takers, or matchers. Now, givers are people who say, sow and ye shall reap. Not necessarily immediately, but just put it out there. People will see you're a giver. It's going to come back in some way or another. Yeah. Now, takers are people who say, you know, it is a dog eat dog's world. So you better take as much as you can before somebody else does. What those people don't realize is that usually they are the dog. Now, matchers are people who say, if you give, then I will give. You don't want to be in a team of matches because everybody starves while everybody's waiting to get. So who do you think are the most successful? Well, no prizes for guessing. Givers. Overall, givers are more successful. Think about it. Who do you want to do business with? Who do you want as a client? Who do you want to bring into your business? Right? Who do you want to, as a friend, a giver, a taker, a matcher? Of course, a giver. So giving is a very powerful strategy of success. Now, of course, there are exceptions, like the ex-presidents of our beautiful country, Jacob Zuma, right? The thing is, how successful will Jacob Zuma go down in history, right? So you can fool some of the people some of the time, but ultimately, his legacy will show him to be the criminal taker that he was. Unfortunately, that was at the expense of some of us, but fortunately, we now have a giver in the presidency. I'm uh, pretty sure about that. And, uh, and that's why we can already feel that our country is moving forward. So there are three kinds of giving. Very simply, with this transactional giving. Now, transactional giving is when you say in a business, you give your product, you give your service, and you get your money in return, right? And that's the most basic form of giving. We want to be able to do a bit more than that, but let's not uh, dis transactional giving, right? I mean, if you think about it, just being a business that gives what is to be expected is often more than what many are doing, right? So give what is expected. Yeah. And it is a wonderful, wonderful world that we live in that you can take your passion, yeah, whatever it is, that service, that product, that skill that you have, and you can bring it into the world and earn a living that way. One of the things that I am so tremendously grateful for when I look around at my apartment and I go, I didn't have to build this apartment because honestly, my building skills, like my eye-hand coordination is not to be emulated. And yet just through words, through sharing words in books, in presentations, in workshops, in seminars, I've been able to take those words, those ephemeral words, yeah, bring them into the world, bring that, take that value and extract the value that I've been able to create this life that I'm so grateful for. Isn't that beautiful? And in some ways, that's what transactions are. They're, they're great. You know, I know we sometimes negative about transactions. No, no, that's wonderful. However, if we really want to be successful, we want to shift from transactional giving to generous giving. What is generous giving? Generous giving is when you give even more than they expect, right? You thought you were coming to this book launch to only see Justin Cohen. And I made sure that I was gonna give you even more, but you never thought that more would be even better than me, the great Jason Greer from The Bachelor. Huh? Come on, admit it. I wanna see some applause here. I wanna see some real applause. 
<laughs> and so that's what we want to do. We want to delight and surprise and give it even more than is expected. And I'll give you a beautiful example of this from one of my clients, a luxury car company. And the dealer principal was telling me about a story about a particular client, very, very wealthy client, uh, who bought one car, but he buy, he buy cars, he had a fleet, and he'd buy cars from different dealerships. But uh, something had happened, the, the, the visor had broken in his car, he ca it came in, and they fixed it, and at the end he said, how much do I owe you? And they said, no, don't worry, that's on us. He wrote them a letter and said, I just want you to know how great it is to feel like I'm not just a number, I'm not just a client, that made me feel like I'm a friend, like you really actually care, and I want you to know from now on I will be buying all my cars from you. Now just take that on board. That visor cost them no more than a couple of hundred bucks. That little extra that they didn't have to do created so much goodwill that in fact the result was infinitely greater than that small act of giving. And that's the power of generous giving. The thing is, folks, we don't just do it so that we can get back. We do it because intrinsically, it's one of the most powerful ways to raise our emotional well-being. So how's this? If you gave your partner or a colleague or a friend, did something, a random act of kindness, you did something special for them, maybe an unexpected cup of tea, it would boost their happiness. But the research shows it would boost your happiness even more than theirs, even more than theirs. Now, that's no excuse to tell your partner how much happier she would be if she made you a cup of tea. But what it tells us is that the gift is really in the giving. Now, psychologists believe that it's got something to do with a neurochemical in the brain called oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is emitted in mother's milk. It creates that lovely, warm bond of connection, right, between a mother and baby. But it turns out that oxytocin is also a natural anti-inflammatory that protects the heart against stress-related damage. So that makes little sense of some other extraordinary research, which shows that, first, the bad news, if in the past year you had a major stressor like going bankrupt or divorced, you would increase your chances of dying by 30%. However, the good news is, if you're somebody who regularly helps others, your increased chances of dying are zero. And the belief is that that's due to oxytocin this wonderful anti-inflammatory. So how do you get the oxytocin flow? You do not need to look for a breastfeeding mother. All you need to do is help someone, connect with someone, give, and your brain will reward you. Why? Well, because your brain, which developed to help you survive and thrive, knows that when you're a giver, it's good for you, right? It's in your interest, and so that's why you get these feel-good chemicals. So. I guess that first law, give to get, is about the most selfish thing you can do and also the most selfless. And that brings us to the third and final form of giving, which is what I call psychological giving. And psychological giving is when you're not actually giving any particular thing, you're giving attention, appreciation, admiration, right? It's a smile. It's a thank you. It's a, hey, how are you doing? Right? It turns out that strong corporate cultures are defined by high quantities of approval cues, attention, admiration, calling people by their name, right? giving them that acknowledgement. And low corporate cultures are defined by high disapproval cues. We don't look people in the eye. We don't know their name. We pass them in the corridor without acknowledging them. Yeah? In the 1940s in Europe, in certain orphanages, it was believed that it was better not to touch the orphans at all. Give them their food, their shelter, look after their physical needs. But these orphans didn't have their psychological needs taken care of because they believed that that would spread germs. The death rate in those orphanages was 75%. 75%. And so is it now clear how absolutely essential connection really truly is? And that's one of the things that is so critical for us to pay some attention to in a time of corona, because loneliness has increased 30%. Creative collaboration is down. Now, 
I'm convinced it doesn't have to be that way. That there are ways to connect and collaborate and not be lonely. And we're doing it right here today, right? This isn't social distancing. This is physical distancing. I don't know where the social distancing thing came from. This is physical distancing. And through physical distancing, we can still be social. We can still connect. And I want to thank you for being here, social and connecting with me and Jason. Jason, over to you. Mute I'm myself. To, there we go. Am I unmuted? Good to you rock and roll. Unmuted. Justin, I got to tell you, it, I think it's one of the first times I've ever really seen you truly speak, and it was fan. Fantastic. Um, I mean, one of the first things, like, I mean, just from the book, before I begin, just, I, I don't know if you can see this book, my silly background's not working properly, but my name is on the front <laughs> of Justin's book. I mean, for goodness sakes, what? This book is invaluable, and it really is, and I, I cannot tell you, you're talking about happiness a moment ago, this is just phenomenal. Um, so it really is amazing that you did that um, and that you're having me here today to host your book launch, your book launch. It's incredible to be a part of this. It really is. Like, it's funny to think that I know, I know this person who wrote the book. It's brilliant. Um, just thank you so much uh, again for this uh, wonderful book. I've got to ask you, though, uh, 21 laws of influence in love and business. Why the 21? Was there a specific reason? <laughs> I, I was really hoping you wouldn't ask that. Uh, so numbers have a kind of magical effect. So uh, Tim, if he's on the call, my publisher will tell you that you can have seven, seven habits of highly effective people. You can have three, you can have five, but you probably don't have eight. You probably don't have 19 and you probably don't have Correct. 24. But yeah. 21, you know, we all came of age at 21. 21 is you become an adult. There's something beautiful and, and, and almost a little mystical about 21. So yeah. maybe this is about, you know, that sort of coming into our, our fullness with 21. Well, because I did a bit of research, my own research, Just. I didn't tell you this, but um, I did my own research. And it turns out that the number 21 symbolizes perfection, integrity, a powerful uni uh, uh, union, uh, unity. And also something very interesting. I know you've been to Washington, D.C., um, and you've been to the Tomb of the Unknown sh Soldier, I'm sure. I think it's, it's quite a, a, a tourist place to go to. But did you know, so now the, the Tomb of the Unknown sh uh, Soldier is guarded 24-7 um, by three guards, full-time. They are hand-picked. They are, it's the highest honor to guard the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. But here's the interesting thing about the number 21. Every soldier takes a series of 21 steps halts for 21 seconds, turns, another one 21 steps, halts for 21 seconds, and that's how they rotate. Now, it's interesting that they chose the number 21. And I, I literally found this out yesterday. Why the 21 gun salute? You know, it's, I think it's got to do with the fact that there's integrity behind it and, and, and unity, bringing everyone together. And I think this is what this book has done. It has brought all 21 of these laws of influence and love and business together in such an amazing read. And that's the other thing about this book, just, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm waxing lyrical here about your book. It's just, this is what makes it so brilliant, is that it's an easy read as well, which is fantastic. You, you've written it in such a way that everyone can can read it, including people like uh, Mapaseka Mokwele, the life coach and host of uh, Single Wives SA, of which you are a co-host and presenter. I'd be very curious to chat to you about that in just a moment. Um, but you've got some other beautiful uh, testimonials here. Uh, on, like, how does that feel for you to get the kind of testimonials? I, these are phenomenal. I mean, we've got Sir Eric Peacock, the chairman, Academy of Chief Executives in the UK. More than a book on relationships, this is a tour de force on leadership. Humbling. Yeah, yeah Jason. I, I think, you know, what I find, re when I was discussing this with my publisher, now, I want to write a book on relationships that's relevant both in love and business. Now that's mm. usually you will see relationships that books that are either about uh, love or either about business. Uh, now I, I, it is always clear to me that many of these laws, in fact, probably most of them apply both to your personal romantic relationships and your business relationships. You know, you, you take something like, let's talk about appreciation. So yeah. appreciation, firstly, it's the number one reason people leave a job. They say that they feel unappreciated, they feel unacknowledged, like people don't care about them. And guess what? The number one factor that 
people complain about uh, in their partners. Same thing. It's lack of appreciation, right? Exactly the same thing. So, uh, Jace, I think I might have just, uh, might, you might have just, uh, I might have just muted you. So I am going to just try and unmute you there because I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, give me one moment, folks. This is uh, kind of looks like it's our first rodeo, right? But it's um, okay. So what I'm going to do is, uh, there we go. So I think what happens with Zoom is that when I uh, mute you, uh, there we go. Uh, and there we go. Unmute. Okay. So I'm going to keep you there. Sorry. Thank you. Um, but but so so this is this is what I find so extraordinary, right? The biggest complaints spouses have about one another: lack of appreciation. We take yep. one another for granted. Biggest complaints employees have: lack of appreciation. In fact, in the high-performing teams that I work with, the research is clear: the number one factor determining the success of a team is not the particular skills. Of course, those are important. But we're talking about extreme success again. It's mm. how the team does feel about one another. Yeah. So if Essentially, high praise teams are high performance teams. High praise is high performance. And I'll tell you a beautiful study on this. This is on doctors, maybe relevant in the, in the age of corona. Uh, th these doctors were given a little token of appreciation before they went in to do a diagnosis for liver cirrhosis, right? Serious business, right? Half got a little token of appreciation to say, thank you, really appreciate the great work that you're doing. The other group got nothing. They go mm. do their diagnosis. The ones who got that little token of appreciation achieved their diagnosis in half the time. And just in case you think they were wow. so happy they were in corners and weren't that effective, they were nearly 20% more effective than the ones who never got a token of appreciation. The mm. moral of the story, if you want an accurate diagnosis from your doctor, don't wait for him to give you a lollipop. Give him one first. <laughs> right? <laughs> Let people know that you value them, that you care. It yeah. comes in small ways. It's a smile, a thank you, a handwritten note. You know, yeah. it's, it's the, you, one of the most powerful leadership uh, uh, tools is appreciation. What gets appreciated gets repeated, right? Mm. It's, it's very, very important. People don't come up to you and, and with tears in their eyes every month to thank you for paying their salary. But you yeah. write a little handwritten note just to say, I noticed, thank you. You pulled out all the stops. I really appreciate it. And I've literally spoken to people who got that note 20 years before from a CEO, went home and put it on the mantelpiece, and it, they still have it to this day. Wow. Just that little note. That's how much a few words of appreciation mm. mean. Hmm. You know, Justin, you're talking about smiling and you've mentioned it a couple of times uh, during the course of this evening so far. And I know if we take a look at some of the aspects of your book and just um, just, just a couple, just to, to give people a bit of a tease of what you can expect. One of the biggest things that stood out for me was the Madiba ESP, where you have hmm. the eye contact, the smile and the posture. I mean, those are effective in not only business, but certainly in relationships as well from a friend perspective, even meeting new people too. Exactly, exactly, Jason. I, 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 I tell the story in the book. I had the privilege of meeting Madiba. It wasn't because I was special. It was because he thought everyone was special. I had <laughs> wow. a presentation and I was standing at the back of the room with the cleaners. And he then at the end went and, and, and connected with virtually everyone in that room, starting with the cleaners, which is only why I had my hand shaken pretty early on. Madiba would look for people who had less status, not more, right? Mm. Most people are looking for people who have more status, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Madiba lived that, ca that, that, that beautiful definition of character. Character is how you treat people who can do nothing for you. Yeah. Right? Well. But I had my moment with him, Jace, and I felt like the center of his world. I felt so special. And... It wasn't because it was Nelson Mandela. I'd met famous people before and I hadn't feel, felt that way. And I tried to understand what is it that he did that, that made me feel so special. And, and I kind of reverse engineered it. I'm a student of success. I want to understand what, what does it take? And I noticed he did three things, three simple things. And yes, the first was eye contact. He, he looked at me, right? He wasn't looking over my shoulder to find somebody better to talk to. He, he acknowledged you, down yeah. To, Acknowledge me, right? He wasn't looking mm. at his phone. Yeah, he was, he, you know, you can be in the room, but not be in the room. Yeah, you know, he was the in presence, that yeah. room, right? And, and you know, the, the, one of the, the beautiful greetings we have in our, in our wonderful country is Sao Borna. And Sao mm. Borna means, I see you. But, you know, it's not just I see you, I see the ceiling. I say, it's, I see you. That's your <laughs> yeah. And when I really see, maybe even your divinity. Yeah. The magic thing happens when you really see people in that way. You know, they reflect back what you see. Right? And so he saw me. You know, he really, 
saw me. So there was, yeah. and that you can't out eye contact, right? So I could smile. Now smile, it seems like almost kind of facile to say to people smile. But you know, there's such fascinating research on smiling in, in the business world. Leaders who smile more have significantly better relationships and results from their people than those who don't. And I'll tell you why that is, it's actually quite fascinating. If you're a leader, folks, you're somebody's meal ticket. And when they come in, they're looking to see, am I okay? And if you walk in with a frown, it could just be because, you know, you've got, I don't know, you just had your corona test and you still haven't got the results yet. It could be for something else completely different, but they're going because it's what it's it's the self-obsession bias, right? We always think it's about me. If you're frowning, there's something wrong. Then we go into the lower brain, right? That's a reptilian brain, fight or flight response. When we're in fight or flight response, lower brain, it means that we take a new coast, nutrients, glucose, oxygen from higher brain to lower brain. It means we're not as focused, we're not as attentive, we're mm. not as creative. Now, if you come in and smile, right? What's happening? You're saying, we're good. You're good. I'm good. We're all good. Now you free up the resources for the prefrontal neocortex. I can focus. I can attend. I can create. And so something as simple as a leader smiling is actually a way to activate the higher brain, that prefrontal neocortex. And when Madiba, you know, Madiba had that smile that could light up a small town. Yeah. When he yeah. smiled at me, I feel special. Yeah. And then, of course, there's this posture, right? Yeah. It's about how you actually hold yourself. And you'll remember Madiba had this beautiful regal posture. And what's really uh, interesting is that uh, at the end of his time on Robben Island, Nelson Mandela was the only prisoner who hadn't been assaulted by the guards. Mm. And that wasn't because he was Nelson Mandela. In the early days, there would have been no problem assaulting him. But it was believed that it was because he had this wonderful regal posture. And it wasn't, mm. you know, I'm the people, I'm better than you. And it wasn't submissive, I'm worse than you. It was, I'm okay, you're okay. Because remember yeah. the mirror network. When you walk in with confidence, with your chin up, with a smile, what are you doing? You're giving people the opportunity to mirror that confidence, that yeah. smile, that glow, that positivity. And that's what Madiba did so beautifully. Hmm. I love the idea of being able to mirror someone else's attitude um, and energy as well. And that's how I'm feeling here tonight, even though we're not together, like physically, you know, socially we are. And it's, it's, it's fantastic still to chat to you. Um, I know also in the book, I don't want to speak what everything's in the book. Otherwise, there's no point to people wanting to get the book. And you really do need to do yourselves a favor and get it. But there's another thing I'd like to get from you. And this is from a personal perspective. Um, Memory is not the, my strongest um, my strongest forte, as some people here might uh, attest to. So um, when remembering names, I know there's a, a, a way to remember names, and it's really important. I mean, they say that uh, a name to a person is the sweetest and most interesting sound in the world. Now, the biggest thing is, how do you always remember everyone's name, especially if you're meeting a few people? Have you got any tips? Mm. So, so, so Jason, interesting, you, you bring up the name as the most sweet sounding sound to anybody's ear. And that, of course, comes from Dale Carnegie. And mm. Dale Carnegie wrote uh, one of the best selling books of all time, uh, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And uh, I'd be interested to know how many people on this call have read that book and how transformative it was for them. And I know that it was certainly for me. In fact, somebody said to me, winning with relationships is how to win friends and influence people for the modern world, right? Because it's got modern day examples and modern stories. And of course, modern research, right? Dale yeah. Carnegie wrote that in the 1930s. Uh, but yes, I, I want to pay homage to Dale Carnegie because it was a book that I think really did transform my, the way that I interact with people. And I realized how important it was. And I picked, uh, perhaps just on that point, I'd like to add, mm. you know, I think a lot of people think, well, you know, how I am is just how I am, you know, but actually, you know, you aren't born how you are, right? You, you, you develop that and, and you develop it unconsciously. And I would say, in many ways, winning with relationships, I, I like to think of it as a relation app. We all know we've got to update our apps on our phone, right? Well, maybe we've got to do a little relation app update every now and again. <laughs> you know, can I improve the way that I actually interact, communicate, and connect with people? Because yeah. this is so, so important. And Jace, you're right. One of those key things is names. Absolutely. Yeah. When you call somebody by their name, they feel like you, you know, you, you've taken that time and that trouble yeah. and that it, it's just something that is, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that really has a tremendous effect. So, so your question is, well, how do you do it? 
Well, first I've got to tell you, I don't have a great memory either, right? And I used oh, to sure. think, oh, well, I'm not great. I'm not great at remembering names. Like some people really are, you know, they yeah. just, they have a very natural memory. But the problem is the moment you say, I'm not great at remembering names, then you really won't remember any names because you won't even try. <laughs> so yes. I, I'm not I remember everyone's name, but I remember a lot more by making the commitment to remember more. Mm. And so there's a couple of ways. Firstly, if I go into a meeting, uh, one of the things that I do when I make notes is I write down everybody's name, right? Yeah. On my computer, pen and paper. So I'm writing the name down. You want to use the name in conversation, right? The more that you use it, the more it imprints for you. And then you want to make a connection. I just, I'll tell you a funny thing. I, this is actually a bit of an embarrassing story. Um, <laughs> but I, and Rick Allen will actually attest to this. This is a, this is a, this is a, I can't believe I'm telling this story. It's a terrible story, but I, I maybe yeah. it, it, it's, uh, it's too late. It's you already started. Day. You got to finish. I know, I know. I can't really go back. But you know, I used to always have a problem with your name. And you think the party is a problem with Jason. I'm super like, famous, on, Justin. I know. I know. I mean, I just, he's that bachelor guy. He's that bachelor guy. Jason, I'm not even kidding you. And, I, and Rick, our mutual friend, I'd say to Rick, Rick, oh man, I, I'm your friend. I mean, I, I feel so bad about it. And I'll tell you what, is that your name is the same name as a kid that I went to school with. And he was a very different human being to you. So, so, so very, very different. And he owned Jason. So somehow uh, you with being a Jason, you know, but he what's was interesting, a much better yeah. more masculine <laughs> guy. You know. Sure. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm sure I'm better at other things. Um, but you know, the thing is, it's so weird because people will always like more often than not, they call me Justin. And like that, really? like it's, that's the thing. If they, if they've forgotten my name, I'm you Justin. Be Green. So you, you it, it, so I, well, you know, like, only after Justin. I met you, just that I started feeling okay with the fact that it's Justin. Um, you know, they got the first initial right, so that's I'm happy with that. Um, so I like that idea. So you just obviously make sure that you use their name in conversation all the time, um, as often as you can, and just try and connect that name to something about that person. Right. And so now, what I do when I think of you, I in my head have paired you with the Jason from school. So I've now created a visual connection of you two guys in the bath, naked. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I heard bar, and then I just left it there. I, just, <laughs> but, I, uh, I don't know yeah. how I feel. So like I, it. <laughs> it's so, so, so interesting. I mean, I don't do that just so that you know, although sure. you'll never see that. Um, <laughs> but but that when you create a crazy image in your head, connecting yeah. that person with another and their two names, you will never forget. Like I will mm. never forget your name is Jason now that I've made that connection, but I had to do that, right? Uh, and so, yeah, it's just, but, but overall, Jason, I think it's about giving a damn. Let, let's yeah. face it, if somebody walked in to the room and you had the sense that, let's say that you, you were single and they were really beautiful and you were like, oh my gosh, I'm so into this person. You're going to remember their name, right? Oh. Or they, you know, the leader of a, an organization that you want to do, but you're going to remember their name. And so I mm. think what it is, 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 is finding that connection to that person that means something to you, right? That this person is special to you in some way. And it doesn't have to be somebody who has more status or success. Like my diva, you know, we, we've got to find something special in everyone. And I think if you take the time to get to know someone, you will remember their name. Right, because mm, mm. now you've, you've formed a connection. So form the connection. Take the time to to do that. You know, and mm. I think this is what's so important, uh, both for winning relationships and for our own emotional well-being. Right. This is why loneliness is becoming an epidemic. You know, thirty yeah. percent increases. We're disconnected, and I tell you what, the best way to get connected is not wait for somebody to connect to you. It's go out and connect with somebody else. Mm. Don't connect. With yeah, don't get exactly. to know someone. Go take some interest in someone. Well, you know, on that connection point, uh, just further to us being connected through this book now, because my name is in the front show of your book, yeah. uh, we're all connected through a mutual friend, if you will, Mnet, because I've just come off the batch to South Africa and you are going into a brand new show called Single Wives SA. How are you looking forward to that? I mean, obviously you are. <laughs> um, so, yo, I, I am and I, I know that some of the single wives are actually on tonight's call they're not allowed to tell us that they are because I don't think that that is uh, I, don't, I don't think we've revealed that to the public yet but no, single yet. wives 
this is hello to, to you. Don't say hello back. Um, but I, I some of the single wives. Uh, Jace, I, it was such a privilege. These are some of the most beautiful, courageous, wonderful women uh, who, uh, you know, were looking for love again. And I think came to single wives expecting to find the love of their lives. Mm -hmm. Some of them did. But I think they all found even more importantly, was themselves. Uh, this is uh, not just another day show. It's a truly transformative show. Uh, I was, oh my gosh, this show totally exceeded my expectations. Mm. Uh, and that was because of our wonderful single wives who were really willing to trust my Paseca, my, my co-host and coach on this and I, and really just throw themselves into the journey. I think this is one of the most transformative shows that I certainly have ever come across. And I look out for these shows. So very, very excited. And I know that we've got a lot of uh, people from Mnet uh, publicity as well. And welcome to those of you who are here. I think Nadine might be with us and, uh, you know, we're doing a, a really terrific job uh, in getting the show out there. And yeah, we air of course on the 3rd of September in the same time slot that the bachelor was in. So that's Thursday night, seven o'clock, 3rd of September. So we've got July, August, so like two months, pretty much, exactly, to the, almost to the day, which is fantastic. So put that in your diary, 3rd of September, uh, Thursday, 7 o'clock, only on Mnet Channel 101. Um, I've done that a few times, actually. Um, <laughs> what exactly is your role, though, on the show, Just? Well, that's an interesting question, Jace. And, you know, originally when we started this show, I was supposed to be the dating guru. And I was like, guys, I'm not no dating guru, right? I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm... <laughs> For me, it's about, relationships, about transformation. It's about personal development. And I got to say a big thank you to Black Swan, our production company. And again, I think we have some of uh, the Black Swan uh, 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 organization here with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Boy, company, did yeah. they, they, they were, I think, I think they were as courageous as the single wives <laughs> because. The, this format, Single Wives, is an Australian format. Uh, it's, it's taken place in a number of countries around the world. And, and we totally reinvented it. So the other versions of the show are more of dating show. This is so much more. And in fact, and, and I hope I'm allowed to say this, but a Fremantle, I believe, who are the uh, originators, uh, I, I've been so impressed by what we've done uh, or I beg your pardon, Mnet, uh, as, as based on what the show was done in other territories, yeah. uh, have have uh, have really just been so excited about how we really reinvented it, and, and that was thanks to Black Swan. So and I guess to answer your question, I'm the transformative mm -hmm. coach along with my Paseca, and we both we, we, we're host and coach, if you like, which is kind of a weird designation. Usually, you've got a host, a coach. And these are very differentiated. Mm -hmm. And now we're both there, you know, we're, we're there connecting with the viewers, introducing the show, and then connecting with our wonderful single wives as well. Mm. So we've got the single wives. Now we've got, <laughs> I'm trying to find the connection here with The Bachelor. So The Bachelor, a whole bunch of single ladies going after one man, where with single wives, you got a bunch of single ex-wives, I presume, who are all looking for love, hopefully. Um, now in The Bachelor, in The Bachelor Mansion, there's... <laughs> There's a fair amount of drama, as uh, you may have seen in the second season. But now, is there, is there drama with single wives as well? Uh, <laughs> Got to give us something. Because I'm wondering, I'm, wondering, I'm starting to sweat, because I'm wondering <laughs> how Mnet how, how will feel when I, when I say this. But I, my understanding was, I think that when, when Mnet uh, first uh, had a look at, at some of the early episodes, they were like, <gasps> There's too much drama going on. <laughs> okay, so I don't think the channel has ever said there's too much drama. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, that's what they said. So yeah, there is no shortage of drama. And I think, Jace, you know, it's all in the, you know, I, I got to be honest, I'm not a big fan of um, a lot of reality shows out there that are based about, on breaking people down. You know, mm -hmm. so I, one of the reasons I love The Bachelor, The Bachelor is about building people up, Single Wives is about building people up. But, you know, those shows that it's, 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 it's really the politics of distraction, you know, and, and it's getting off on pushing other people down. And, you know, this is one of the points I make in Winning With Relationships. The weakest way to raise yourself up is to push somebody else down. 
That's mm-hmm. the weakest way to raise yourself up. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the most powerful way to raise yourself up is to raise up the people around you. And I think what we'll see in Sigma is, yes, there's a lot of drama. That drama is not this manufactured drama to, yeah. to denigrate people. It's just because these wonderful single wives were going through a lot. You know, many of them come mm. from some very difficult previous relationships. Uh, for some of them, I mean, one of our single wives had not dated for 20 years right? Because she'd been in an abusive relationship and she, she you know, was just uh, really scared, quite frankly, of yeah. men after the abuse that she'd been through, right? I think mm. a lot of people in South Africa can, can connect with that, you know, and... And, 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 and we're going to see and, that so, as well. And we're going to see that. And, yeah. you know, it, that was difficult and that was, there was a lot of drama around that. But ultimately, I think all of them well, wow, all of them really rose up to to overcome, and I, I think they would all say that uh, that they really did have a transformational experience. Okay, well, we're going to open up the floor in a moment to some questions. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat there. Um, while you're thinking of your questions and writing them down, um, just to, Matt, where do we find this book? Just where can we get it? Uh, so, uh, very proud to say that it is at all bookstores. Well, when I say all bookstores, it should be at all bookstores, but it might take a few more weeks to get there. I'm very excited to say that it is at CNA, uh, okay. and that is no just to exclusive books. Exclusive books have supported me, and each one of my six books over, gosh, how many years ago? When did I write my first book? It's too many years ago. Yeah. Uh, but CNA uh, is, 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 is really wonderful to have on board because they have you know, huge penetration around the country. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, it's also on Amazon and Take A Lot. So oh, pretty brilliant. much okay. uh, everywhere where good books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> Some key takeaways from the book. Just anything in particular that you'd like to kind of put forward as a sort of a little carrot to say, listen, you can't do without this book. Listen, there's 21 reasons why you can't do this without this book, but anything in particular. Well, you know, just I would say I had to have the humility to say, I don't always get it right. And sometimes I get it profoundly wrong. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I hope that I won't offend anybody by, by citing uh, the third uh, law of influence, which is don't be an arsehole. <laughs> um, and and that, you know, that's, that, that, that you wouldn't have found yeah. in How to Win Friends and Influence People. No, and, my wife know, made might... me read that chapter twice, actually. <laughs> 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 to my mind, she didn't need to, Jace, because <laughs> you are what we call in uh, uh, Jewish people have got a term. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful term. It's, it's, it's called mensch. And a mensch, and I always hear my grandfather using that term and grandmother, and they would use it to describe somebody who they really respected and admired wow. and acknowledged. And, and, and the word really means somebody who's honorable. You know, somebody who's ethical and honorable. And, and I remember as a kid hearing them use that word. And man, I just hope that one day somebody might refer to me in that way. Yeah. And, and I can tell you that uh, I am not always a mensch if I am at times. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes I'm able. Because this isn't as clean cut as good people and bad people. I think yeah. all of us, I think the nicest people can get it wrong. And I know I do. Yeah. I, I tell you, we teach what we need most to learn, you know, and this is, this is, I, I find myself often saying to, to audiences, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite here. So I'm going to tell you, you know, in fact, many of the stories in this book is when I screwed up, I got it wrong. I messed up. Yeah. yeah. Because I think we learn so much by acknowledging when we screw up because God knows we do. Right. And so this is a standard, this sets a very high standard, which I am always trying to live up to. And so, so, so I think, I think, you know, you asked me for that message. I think it's, mm. let's, let's be humble. Let's be humble. Let's, let's acknowledge that none of us get it right all the time. If you can never say you're wrong, you can never say you're smarter today than you were yesterday. Yeah, exactly. And then, Last but not least, any um, testimonials that you'd like to kind of highlight? Um, I know you've got a number of them, uh, but anything in particular that you'd like to mention about it? Because uh, it is it's incredibly wonderful to read and to think that these people, oh, it's amazing. How did you get all these people? <laughs> it's, great. Um, it's amazing. 
I, I, and I'm very grateful to everybody who, who gave a testimony, and I really want to thank you for that. Uh, Jace, I do see a question coming in from Gustav. Uh, what do you recommend for business relationships during COVID pandemic? Yeah. Uh, and these relations constraints that is currently happening. So firstly, Gustav, thank you so much for asking us this very important question. So again, I want to reiterate that I don't know who came up with the social distance. This, this isn't social distancing. We are not socially distanced right now. We are socially connected. We are physically distant. Now, what the research tells us is that rapport, connection, and liking tends to be at its highest when you are in physical uh, proximity with someone, okay? It is highest. However, there are pretty good substitutes. So what we're doing right now, the visual digital connection is next best, right? So where you can, try to connect with a client, with your partner, with a friend, visually if you can. We don't have the same nonverbal cues, we can't have quite the same level of rapport, but it, it's, it, it's not a bad second, right? Next up is the phone, right? Just audio, and then it's text. So if you want to increase the level of connection, if you want to increase the level of rapport, I know you think text is, sometimes you're going to text, we all text, that's fine. But just know that with texting, you're not going to get quite the same level of connection and rapport. Mm -hmm. So this is fine for quick communication, but particularly if you're in conflict, with someone, or you know you really need to build this relationship, or you need to build that trust. Remember, people do business with people they know, trust, and like, right? So you, you really know you need to build that. In the age of corona, try to make it a visual connection, yeah? Try to make it that visual connection, mm. because that is certainly going to help. The other thing that we know, Joe, so interestingly, The Economist ran an article just last week, the death of the office. People have realized we don't need offices to the extent yeah. that we thought. Uh, commercial property owners are, are very concerned. Now, I'm not saying we all going to be working from home forever, but we've realized that actually productivity levels can even be higher when you're working at home than in the office, higher. However, collaboration goes down. So hmm. what can we do about it? We need to actively cultivate collaboration and connection. Yes, these Zoom meetings, one after the other, can be exhausting. And by the way, that's why you need decompression between them. Usually we had driving from meeting to meeting for decompression. Don't schedule them back to back if you can. Create some space in between. Go smell the flowers. Play with your kitty cats like I like to do in between, which is going to get your oxytocin flowing. And we have to feel good. Hey, kitty cat. And then you're going to go to your next Zoom meeting with a little bit of a spring in your step, right? So be sure to look after yourself, right? Mm -hmm. However, you do need these group visual meetings to build collaboration. They're very important. Don't neglect them. And that is, unfortunately, yes, the one downsides. And yes, loneliness has gone up. But that's largely because people are waiting for others to connect with them. Don't mm -hmm. wait for them reach out, pick up the phone, get on a Zoom call, right? Yeah. Be proactive about building your relationship. You need this for your emotional well-being. Remember, folks, it's the single biggest external predictor of happiness is relationships. So you need it. And so, oh, well, they didn't call me. Ah, so I don't know. I don't, well, then too bad. <laughs> okay? So it's their fault, isn't it? It's it's our fault. Fault. Why didn't you call me? Exactly. Or, or, you know, people say, you know, they, they never give, so why should I give? Or, or she, you know, we talk about appreciation. Right? Yeah. You know, how important is in relationship? And I remember a lady saying to me, yeah, you know, Justin, you're so right. My husband never expresses appreciation. I said, okay, when was the last time that you did? Crickets, right? Yeah. Be Gandhi. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Yeah. Be the change you want to see in the world. And let me tell you, the reward for appreciation, you get more reward by giving appreciation. Well, what happens? When you express appreciation, you give gratitude. Gratitude increases emotional well-being because you feel the richness of having this person in your life. But they start smiling. Remember the mirror neuron network. You start smiling, right? So this is this wonderful, virtuous circle that happens, right? So don't wait for others. And just I'd also say perhaps to Gustav's point um, is that you know, yes, if you're living at home with your family in close quarters, 
you, at times are going to get a little bit irritable, right? And, and give, cut people some slack. Don't assume the worst. Forgive, right? It's probably not personal. You know, I quote Hanlon's razor in the book, and Hanlon said, never attribute to malice what can't be attributed to stupidity. Now, <laughs> I don't love the stupidity part, so I've done a reformulation of Hanlon. Never attribute to malice what can't be attributed to something else. Most people aren't deliberately trying to hurt you, right? Mm. The, hurt people hurt people, right? Don't get me wrong. If you're in an abusive relationship, get out, okay? Get out. But if it's just, you know, a little bit of irritability and be the bigger person, give them some slack, forgive. And, you know, forgiveness doesn't mean condone, right? You don't have to condone what somebody's done. And women with relationships will, one of the things that, uh, particularly for anybody in a marriage, I'm going to share some really powerful research with you. Uh, it's called the Four Horsemen of Divorce. John Gottman can predict divorce with a 94% accuracy, 94%, mm -hmm. based on four things that people do. Here's the interesting thing. Those who stay married, those who get divorced, have the same amount of disagreements. Same amount. It's how they disagree. How they disagree, right? And so it comes to collaborative communication yeah, versus destructive communication yeah and so yes people are stressed mm -hmm. you know emotional distress severe enough to be considered a mental disorder has increased sevenfold during the time of corona understand there's a lot of people in pain out there by the way you may be in pain out there you might be feeling a little helpless right now well guess what if you're feeling helpless find somebody to help because the best way for you <laughs> To feel empowered is to demonstrate your power in helping somebody else. Yeah. Mm. So remember, it goes back to law number one, get to give, give to get. Right. You want to get more, give more, give more love, give more affection, give more connection, give more phone calls, right? Give more. I'm just going to come right back at you. Yeah. Well, I mean, just without a doubt, you have given us, tonight so much uh, that we can be thankful for um, your wisdom is beyond so thank you for giving of your time and and for being and thank you for giving us this 21 laws of influence in love and business winning with relationships